great to have the privilege of delivering my first presidential address to Liverpool. I would like to take this opportunity to thank this diocese for the warm welcome you have given to me since I have arrived in April. I have enjoyed meeting a diverse host of people in the parishes, schools, chaplaincies of the Diocese of Liverpool. From the very young to the old, in the towns, rural areas, and city regions, in the traditional settings of the church, and among the newer expressions of church, from the splendor of the cathedral to the simplicity of the house group, I have seen the rich and varied way that God is at work among us. And while I'm thanking people, I want to comment to Synod, the leadership that has maintained mission and ministry in, your, in our diocese. Bishop Berv, the Archdeacons, Mike Eastwood, and the staff team at St. James's House, and indeed yourselves at Synod. I have come to a diocese that is united in purpose and focused on its vision to ask God for a bigger church to make a bigger difference with more people knowing Jesus and more justice in the world. I remain wedded to that vision and the key principles of introducing people to Jesus, deepening disciples, nurturing new leaders, and working for justice. I have spent my time observing and learning and want to present to you, Synod, some of my early reflections on what I have seen. I would like to offer you some of my own thoughts around what I would dream and pray before commenting on how we might journey together. Coming from the Diocese of Chelmsford, I see Liverpool experiencing the challenges familiar to the rest of the Church of England. We minister in a challenging time. The financial challenges we face are common to many, but Synod knows the uniqueness of a diocese with no historic assets and resources to meet the presenting budget deficits. This underpins the conversation we are having with the National Church, and we pray for that conversation as it continues. These financial challenges are ones we mirror from society. We are called to a region that suffers some unequal division of the forces between South and North. Leveling up has not reached these parts in any significant way. So as the church looks to boost its finances, we are asking more of a people challenged by the cost of living crisis and more. These challenges can make us anxious and wary, prone to argue among ourselves, scared of change, and unconfident about putting our heads above the parapet. It creates amongst laity and clergy leaders, particularly those working in isolation, a weariness and despondency, which is so demoralizing for our moral and spiritual well being. In our diocese, we are committed to the clergy covenant, have invested in staff well being, and I'm determined that the future involves us coming together in supportive groups, looking out for one another. Jesus laid down a model of working in teams. He sent people out in twos and in groups. He took time to be away from the crowd. He knew when to engage and when to stand back and take time. We need to model that in our lives and our ministry. For if we are sending a message out to our communities, that we are very anxious church, then it is no wonder why people might think twice about wanting to belong. That is why I'm encouraged when I see the opposite, the resilience of clergy and congregations bringing great community and social engagement. When I see the way in which congregations have embraced the parish giving scheme more than in any other diocese. When I see the number of digital giving boxes, when I see the participation in Generosity Week, when I see all this, I'm heartened to witness God at work. And I'm heartened by the way in which we are tackling huge challenges of dealing with a climate crisis, of tackling racial justice. And I commend the work of our racial justice team, the magnificent work of the Triangle of Hope, and the way that we are facing up to the truth of the past. 
acknowledging it and offering restitution while also looking to tackle the current evils of the modern slave trade and draconian immigration policies. The later is a topic I have spoken out about a great deal. And I'm heartened by the places where clergy are coming together to bring their diverse skills, their different church traditions, their wide theological perspectives to focus on what is important. The great commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ, to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. For I pray for a diocese that is united in Christ, who calls us to be church and is at our head. We pray we may have disagreements and differences as the ongoing debate around human sexuality shows, but we must be united. Unity is not uniformity. We need the rich blend of traditional and new, of all church traditions and theological integrities. If we are to appeal to the wider world, we need to show our underlying values and that we can be confident in who we are, allowing people to make their choice about whether to join us on this journey. Our unity needs to be self-keeping. It needs to be sacrificial. It must be based on more than belonging to the same pension fund or praying the same collect. I hope and pray that we would spend our time affirming the center, which is Jesus Christ, rather than defining our boundaries. If we are to be that people displaying our value, then we need to be strong and confident in our story. This, I admit, is a long-standing concern of mine, that Christians have lost the knowledge of God's great story as written in the 66 books that make up our Bible. We must reclaim that understanding of the scriptural story, and we must be confident in telling it. Young and old, lay and clergy, we must be confident in the story and be able to show how our story fits into God's great story. This is an expression of our inner journey of the diocesan role of life, to pray, read, and learn, to draw from the Bible, the great spiritual traditions, and the inspiring Christian teachers. We must be sure that we can tell others the difference God has made to us and why knowing God through Jesus is so important to this generation. I pray that we regain our biblical narrative. And I pray that we reach out in the way Christ compels us to reach out. I wish there wasn't in injustice in this world that makes this so necessary. But while we have injustice, we must speak up against it. We must staff the food banks, get alongside the lonely, do the works that we are called to do in Jesus' name, and be the voice of the voiceless in our communities. Again, this is the expression of the outer journey in the diocesan role of life, to tell, serve, and give. We are called to be a Christian presence, but that presence is wasted if you are not using it to be a strong and positive impact on those around us. We must journey together. And one of the things I have witnessed in this diocese is how you have been trying over many years to journey together. The long obedience to that journey of faith. Now you will have heard the journey in Wigan its successes and challenges, its mission and its controversies. I urge you to go beyond the headlines and to see this for what is there, a good and faithful attempt to take the challenges the world sets before the church. Church began, is achieving so much and learning so much. And I thank God that we have been given the opportunity to try to grow his kingdom in fresh ways. As I thank God for the journey, which we call Fit for Mission, each and every one of you will have an opinion on Fit for Mission. And this opinion will be informed by what can, what can be seen at times, a campaign of claim or counterclaim, of for and against, of good and of bad. I hope we can engage in a different conversation on Fit for Mission. 
I worry that all we hear about is the creation of fear and anxiety and not the sense of hope and vision that it is meant to be. We need to see this as a journey it actually is. The bringing together of people to try and face the inevitable challenges that we have been given as a church and to meet them practically and creatively. Fit for mission is not an initiative, but an attitude, a missional response. It is about local people discerning a vision from God or how the kingdom could be in their area. And that discernment has to be a process of ongoing learning from begin into cohort one, from cohort one into cohorts two and three, from cohorts two and three into whatever lies beyond. Fit for mission will never be set till program. It will be the people of God engaging in the mission of God, locally, determinedly, and humbly. We have significant challenges as we think around the parochial or congregational approaches to mission and ministry that we may have inherited. We are called to be the body of Christ, which has many parts, each part with a different function, but all parts working together to further the mission of Christ. The Church of Christ is the church university, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. But we see the parish system as a vital support for the wider church vision of a Christian presence in every community. Can we reimagine the parish system to make it work for the 21st century in such a way that we remain focused on our presence in every community while working together for better resourcing across a bigger geographical area? There is much that we can learn from the good examples we already have in our diocese. We need to recapture the sense of missional awe and zeal we see in Acts 2, where all who believed were together and had all things in common, where through praising God and having the goodwill of all people, we find that day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is what I want to see a church bringing together the people whom God so loved that he gave himself on the cross. We need to recapture the sense of mutuality that was found in the Church of Acts, a bringing together of possessions, skills, and talents shared across the church. The Apostle Paul's many letters are to different churches in Corinth, Rome, Galatia, each with their own challenges each different, but all valued. We need to be that church, locally formed, to meet the context of the community we serve. It is a way forward and a conversation that needs to be had. It can be shaped by good structures and great governance and supported by our diocesan and national church institutions. But it must be entered into at a local level by committed Christians called to walk humbly love mercy, and show justice to the world. So Synod, I want you to feel encouraged by what you have in the Diocese of Liverpool. I want you to be encouraged by the networks, committed, networks of committed Christians faithfully working to the mission of God. I want you to see the enthusiastic faces of the newly confirmed young and old as they make their promises to God. I want you to be encouraged by the church communities that are growing, maybe in small ways, but growing nonetheless. I have seen this in the places I have been, the conversations I have had, and the stories I have heard. And I hope to continue to see it as I carry on visiting the parishes and communities in this wonderful diocese of Liverpool. God bless you. Thank you very much, Bishop John. Thank you for those that reflection, that that, that insight, um, and for the encouragement and the vision. So thank you. Um, this really brings us to the the end of our Darson Synod. Um, and thank you to everyone for participating. I'm glad we're going away on a note of encouragement. And I'll just ask Bishop John now if he will close us in prayer. Thank you. 
Let us pause for a moment, giving thanks to God for what we are and what has called God called us to be. For our mission and ministry together in this diocese of Liverpool. Even for the challenges we face. Praying for resilience and strength and hope in Christ. And we continue to hold our world, our wider context in our prayers, particularly the communities in Palestine and Israel. Praying for God's peace in this world and lasting solutions to the conflicts that we have. Now may the love of God surround you, the peace of God dwell in you, the presence of God watch over you, and all the saints and angels of God grant you their communion, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always.